Hi. So what is the value of the speed of light? Well, the speed of light is exactly 299,792,458 meters per second, and not a fraction over and not a fraction under. That's pretty darn fast. That's seven and a half times around the world in one second. So you may be wondering, how the heck can we get it so precise? Very precise, actually. But it's not the reason you may think it is. We actually made it that value. And scientists actually no longer run experiments to determine the speed of light with greater precision. Well, if that sounds a little bit weird to you or silly to you, there's actually a good reason for it. So stay tuned. In this video, I'm going to discuss how we got to this point and I'll also touch on how we measure things to set standards. Now, over the last few centuries, a number of scientists, starting with Römer in the 17th century, tried to work out exactly how fast light travels. Now, I cover a number of those attempts in a previous video, and I encourage you to have a look at those as they lay the groundwork for what I'm discussing now. And you'll find the link here and also in the description below. And a number of those attempts were done by what we refer to as the time of flight method. Now, in essence, measure a set distance, have a really precise way of measuring the time of flight for that distance, in this case, a light beam, and then use the two values to determine the speed, distance over time. Now, one of the most accurate measurements was done by Albert Nicholson in the early 30s. And he, he set up a long tube about 1.6 kilometers long and then set up a series of mirrors so that the light path of a light source could travel back and along the tube. And by using that spinning mirror, he was able to determine the time it took. I'm not going to go in great detail here, but basically he used the methodology that Foucault had used in the earlier part of the 19th century, where he also used the spinning mirror. And again, look at my video, I will discuss that in greater detail. But one of the key hallmarks which led to a high level of precision was that Mickelson was able to evacuate the tube practically of all its air, since air does cause refraction and thus affect the speed of light. Now that's not an easy task for a 1.6 kilometer tube. Now unfortunately Mickelson died while his experiment was still being conducted, but his results were published posthumously and he got a value in 1931 of 2.99774 by 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. Now, that is 0.006% out from the accepted value today. And the accuracy was so good for the time that it actually became the standard for the speed of light for the next decade or so. But this time of flight method can only take you so far. Then in the 1940s, the development of radar required an even more precise value than what Mikkelsen had determined. So Lewis Essen used a microwave cavity to determine a more accurate value. Now I covered this in a previous video involving chocolate. And so again, I'll put the link up here and the link below if you want to have a closer look at his methodology. But the problem we encounter with any measurement of speed is that it relies on your precision of your measurement of distance and time. And both rely on a very precise meaning for the meter and the second. In essence, what is a meter? What is a second? You're not going to get a more precise value of the speed of light if there is some uncertainty in what the meter actually is and what the second actually is. Now, let me explain with a simple analogy. I want to determine the speed of a toy car as it moves across the table. And I'm going to use a stick that's a meter long and I film it so I can see how far it travels in exactly one second. And I time its journey and I find that it travels one meter in one second. So its speed is one meters per second. Now, how precise is that? So you say, can't we get more precise than that? Sure. So let's take my stick and divide it up into a hundred sections so we get centimeters. So I do that and I actually find that it doesn't travel the full meter, it actually travels only 95 centimeters. So now my speed is 0.95 meters per second. It's a more precise method and possibly more accurate assuming that the car was traveling at the same speed than the, from the first time. Now I could go further. If I divide each hundredth of a section by 10, of course we get millimeters and now I find it doesn't travel 95 centimeters but 945 millimeters. So now my speed is 0.945 meters per second. Again, it's a more precise method and possibly a more accurate one, assuming that the cars were always traveling at the same speed every single time. But can you see a flaw in my methodology? Was my stick truly a meter to begin with? 
my first measurement may actually be okay if my meter was out by a millimeter or so, but the latter measurements would actually be flawed. So what defines a meter? Well, over the centuries, the determination of the meter changed, each time getting more and more precise. So it started with the French after the French Revolution, and the meter was defined as one ten millionth of the path from the North Pole to the equator passing through Paris. And this became the standard for everyone to use. Then it was changed to two etchings on a platinum iridium alloy bar. Again, this became the standard. And in the early part of the 20th century, there was further discussion about replacing this alloy with a newly discovered alloy such as Invar that had even a lower expansion rate because that would also affect the length. But in every case, there is always a small uncertainty. As you do more precise measurements of the speed of light, those uncertainties become more and more noticeable. And yet, the actual speed of light, just like my toy car, however you measure it, hasn't changed. So in 1960, both the meter and the second received a new definition. The meter was related to the wavelength of a particular spectral line of Krypton 86. Specifically, the meter is the length equal to 1,650,763.73 wavelengths in a vacuum of the radiation corresponding to the transition between the levels 2p10 and 5d5 of the Krypton 86 atom. What a mouthful. Don't get hung up about what this specifically means. And you can do some research on that if you wish. But the point is, this was much more precise than our platinum iridium alloy rod that was held as a standard. Now what about the second? In 1967, the second became redefined in terms of the hyperline frequency of the ground state of cesium-133. Again, there is too much physics here to explain what this means specifically for this particular video, but that could be a subject for a future video on measurement standards. But suffice to say, if you have more precise values for the meter and the second, then you're going to be able to get more precise values for the speed of light. So in 1972, another experiment was devised to measure the speed of light using lasers. In essence, if you can set up a laser to a very specific wavelength and therefore determine a very specific frequency, you can determine the speed by simply multiplying the two values. That's V equals F lambda. Now, prior to that, there was a great challenge because either you could have an EMR where you know the frequency well, but then the measurement of the wavelength was problematic, which was the case with microwave experiments, or vice versa. You can have a very precise value for measuring the wavelength, but then determining the frequency was problematic, which was the case for a lot of laser studies prior to the 70s. Then in 1972, Ken Everson and his team determined the frequency of methane stabilized laser to a very high degree of certainty, and then using interferometry and with this frequency determine the wavelength to a very high degree of certainty. And the two measurements then allow them to work out the speed of light by simply multiplying those values. And the value was 100 times more certain than the accepted value at that time. Now I haven't even included other attempts at the measurement of the speed of light. For example, there was the method using the electromagnetic constants by Rosa and Dorsey in 1907 and the use of radio interferometry by Froome in 1958. You can research those. The point I want to make though is that as technology improved, so did the precision of the speed of light. But one thing underpinning them all, right from the beginning, was that the standard for the meter and the second was paramount. Now the second is still relatively straightforward. It's still determined by the frequency of the transitions in season, and this can be measured extremely well. So therefore, how the meter was defined therefore determined how the value of the speed of light was determined. But the more precise we got with the light, the more imprecision of the meter became a factor, even with the new definition of the meter. For example, the advent of lasers and the use of Krypton transition levels, well, they found some asymmetry, and that resulted in two values for the speed of light, depending on how you measured those transitions. Suffice to say, the improved tools actually increase the uncertainty of the final values. And then there's the fact that the meter is actually not constant. The meter ruler is not a meter if it's moving. That is, Einstein's theory of relativity predicts that length contracts if there's relative motion between the object and the observer. So in 1975, the decision was made by the General Conference on Weights and Measures that rather than this meter and the second defining the speed of light, it was better to define the meter by the speed of light. 
The speed of light, of course, is fixed for all frames of reference, as Einstein correctly argued. So the speed of light was set precisely to 299,792,458 meters per second. Just to make it absolutely clear, this is not an arbitrary number. All the measurements of the speed of light got closer and closer and closer to this value over time. And therefore, the meter now has a new definition. The meter is the length that the path is traveled by light in a vacuum during the time interval of 1 over 299.792.458 of a second. So why is this important? Just like the example where the accuracy of radar in World War II was essential to the war effort and thus dependent on the most precise measurement of the speed of light at the time, much of today's technology today depends on this precision. For example, in astronomy, even the smallest variation out from the speed of light can have a very big impact on our study of the motion of stars and galaxies. It's also essential in the understanding of Einstein's theory of relativity, in which in turn governs our understanding of the universe and its expansion and our understanding of space-time. But let's get closer to home. Your phone has GPS. The accuracy of the GPS satellites are dependent on that speed of light. So any uncertainty in the speed of light would result a greater uncertainty in your location that the GPS determines. So you know that circle that is often drawn on maps around your location, which shows the level of uncertainty of your determined location. Well, that circle will be much, much bigger if there was a greater uncertainty in the speed of light. That's not a great outcome if you're lost. So I hope I have helped, at least in a small part, just why the speed of light is set. Please drop a comment down below if this has been particularly helpful. And as always, please press the like button, share on social media, and subscribe to keep up with my latest videos. And maybe please consider supporting me via Patreon. My name is Paul from High School Physics Explained. Take care and bye for now.